I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to a very crowded and uh, vibrant school committee meeting of Monday, March 25th. This is your notice that this, me that this meeting is being electronically recorded. Uh, we are starting tonight with a recognition for all of the incredible artwork that is in our conference room. And for that, I'll turn it over to Assistant Superintendent Lori Regan. Okay, thank you, Chairman Geddes. Um, as you stated earlier, we're honored to have so many families and students here with us tonight. Um, in, the old <coughs> school, um, in the old Francis Dito conference room, we honored students periodically um, throughout the year. And we, had, we wanted to continue that tradition in the new building as well, but we wanted to expand upon it. And so we've certainly done that this evening. Um, and so um, this is the first night, which makes it very special, of our very first art installation. And so uh, you should be honored to have been selected for this event this evening. Um, and with that, I would also like to thank Miss uh, Donia Lemieux. She's our visual arts coordinator. That was her um, vision and coordination of all the art that's on that back wall. I also want to make sure we thank um, our main department <coughs> for actually making it reality, having all of this art up on the walls. Um, and um, I'd be remiss if I also didn't take this moment to thank our um, art educators in the Attleboro Public Schools. It's their creativity, uh, their skill, and their passion that um, supports our students and helps them to become the artists that they are today. So with that, I'd like to um, hand it over to uh, Ms. Lemieux, and she will um, start us off this evening. Um, hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for having us here. I am so excited about this gallery wall. To have art showcased um, is just a, a, a pleasure. Um, it's any opportunity to showcase the incredible work of these talented student artists is a wonderful thing. Um, so my favorite museum in New York is the Whitney Museum, uh, and they focus on particular work that's created by living artists. Um, my shirt has the motto that's highlighted in their gift shop, and it says, there are artists among us. Um, so I thought that really fit with what we're doing tonight. Um, it reiterates the notion that talented creators and visionaries <coughs> are still making their mark all over the world as we speak. There are artists among us here tonight, uh, student artists as well as wonderful art educators uh, that I have the pleasure to work with. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to announce each artist highlighted here tonight. Um, those that are here can come up and accept their certificates, um, but I'm going to announce all students. Uh, we're going to start with um, Hill Roberts Elementary School. Their art teacher is Gabrielle Sullivan. And the two students who are highlighted from Hill Roberts are Callan Phillips and Maham Niem. And as the Hill Roberts students are coming up the uh, for the uh, community, uh, the certificate reads, the Attleboro School Committee hereby extends its appreciation to student name for contributing to the student artwork display in the Francis Ito Conference Room, for helping to ensure the conference room of the governing body of the Attleboro Schools is a welcoming, vibrant, and student-centric atmosphere, the school committee extends its sincere gratitude. Thank you. From Hyman Fine Elementary School, we have Violet Develis and Jaden Ortiz Campos. From Studley, um, art teacher Kara Kushner, we have Daisy Marchesi and Joseph Castano. <laughs> From Thatcher Elementary School, thank you. Uh, Nancy Dickinson is their art educator. We have Nadia Woods and Athena Corrente. Congratulations. Awesome work. From Willett Elementary School, our teacher is Nellie Nicoloro. We have Jackson Medeiros and Hadassah 
Con Calvis. Did I say it wrong? Con Calvis. Congratulations. From Brennan Middle School, art teachers Tracy Cornifal and Tanya Burry. We have Emma Sorrento, uh, Eliana Kennedy, Julia Camara, and Samaya Lafoum. All right, from Coelho Middle School, our teachers Kristen Girardi and Leah Stevenson. We have Riley Patterson, Michael Mercer, Jaylene Ramos, and Aries Salcido Tejada. From Wamsada Middle School, uh, our teachers Melody Medeiros and Tova Stevenson. We have Addison DeFossis, Autumn Boynton, Maya Doisier, and Olivia Cummins. And finally, from the high school, um, Lindsay Nygaard is their art teacher. We have Sharisha Lafoum, Karen Aldana, Jacqueline Esteban, and Carissa DaCosta. Thank you, that's, that's everybody. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. I wanna thank all the families, the art educators, the administration for supporting me through this and for facilities for Frank who helped me hang this entire wall. He was fantastic. Um, we look forward to honoring many more students in the uh, years to come. So thank you all for coming and have a wonderful evening. Before everyone leaves, uh, I do want to give uh, anyone on the committee an opportunity to, to comment on the artwork. Ms. Johnson? Uh, thank you, Mr. Geddes. Just thank you, everybody, for coming out, um, for all of your efforts, for sharing this beautiful artwork with us and letting us display it in the, uh, in the Zeta room. Mr. Larson? Yeah, I, just, I also want to thank everybody for the artwork. It, it helps us remember uh, what we're all here to do. And uh, it's a great reminder to have right in front of us. So thank you. Mr. Storrs. Thank you. Um, you know, we started this back in the old building before we had this beautiful new building. And uh, we've been missing it for a little while. So we're very happy to have it. And so thank you to uh, loaning us your artwork for a little while. Um, you know, Attleboro is more than just STEM. As important as it is, you guys put the A in STEAM. So, you know, art is very important. And great job. Thank you. And uh, I will say, I, I shared with some of the folks that uh, before the meeting got started, it's, it's exciting to see such incredible artwork, but it can also get distracting because it's behind the administration when they're, when they're speaking to us and it's just so incredible <laughs> and it's so much brighter than uh, what this very gray room was for the first year we were in here. So thank you all very much. Thank you. If you want to stay in here about budget and other stuff, you're welcome, but. That's fair. <clears throat> Did I tell you I'm going to the, the NASCAR Hall of Fame Tuesday night?
<laughs> yeah, we're doing uh, our cocktail hour there. I, I went and visited a friend down there, and uh, let's just say her son and I had the uh, two-man tire change record there for quite a while. Like really? Day. Okay. I hope they'll let me pound a few butt heavies and give it a try. <laughs> It's a cool place. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited for it. Unironically excited. It's in Uptown. Yeah, we're staying like a 10 minutes, a 10 minute walk away near the Civic Center. There's a Nicki Minaj concert that same night. Tickets for 90. I'm like, I don't know if I'm paying 90 to go see her. What's that? Uh, so the. Uh, it's exciting. As the last little bit of uh, the crowd departs the room. Um, uh, we are going to uh, skip over our student advisory update for tonight. Um, unfortunately, our student advisory uh, members uh, were not able to attend. Uh, so the next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Chairman. I will endeavor to uh, compete for your attention uh, better moving forward. <laughs> I do know I have some uh, stiff competition behind me. Um, Ms. Regan has arranged for an important uh, update this evening on NIAS, so I'll turn it over to her. Okay, thank you so much. Um, tonight we have uh, Ms. Campbell, Ms. Kelly Reed, and Mr. Bob Westwater that will provide us with an update on where they are in the NIAS process. So I will hand it over to Ms. Reed, I think, who might be in the driver's seat All for right. this. I feel important. Hello, everyone. When we were tasked um, last year, they said, oh, Alvaro High School is, is ready for an accreditation. I think because of a global pandemic, a new building, and lots of other outlying factors, um, we were a little bit behind schedule with NEASC. But um, the steering committee of Kelly Reed and Bob Westwater have embraced what we now see as a real opportunity for Attleboro High School to uh, see what we're doing, what we're doing well, and listen to all of our staff in where we want to go. So we actually see this year and the beginning of our 10-year accreditation process to be exciting. I think you want to um, actually you know what I was thinking maybe we should do the, the timeline first. Okay. Yeah. So go to like slide. Um, all right. So um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the kind of accreditation process and how it works, we thought we'd just do a quick review of that, and then if you had questions, you could um, kind of jump in. Um, but the way NES works is that it starts with a self-reflection. So there are five kind of standards of, um, of uh, they call them principles of effective practice that they ask schools to kind of take <coughs> some time to reflect upon and kind of where they are in that um, that current moment, um, you know, and kind of uh, you know kind of score ourselves along a rubric. Um, so that's where we are right now, and so we are, you know, collecting feedback from staff uh, and, you know, uh, administration on uh, these five standards, and then uh, we will write up a report um, and submit that to NIESC, and sometimes in October. Um, in November, NIESC sends a, um, you know, cohort of, uh, you know, educators from participating, other participating schools, um, and they will come in after reading our report talk to staff, talk to kids, see what we're about here at the high school, um, and give us some recommendations on our, you know, kind of stated priority areas. Uh, and, you know, our, you know, hopefully they're in line with, you know, what we say, but if not, they'll give us some recommendations. Um, and then we have two years to act on those recommendations. So two years to kind of um, do the work to uh, address some of our priority areas and the re recommendations of the NES committee. Um, and they come back in December of 2026 to assess how well we uh, have done in making progress towards meeting those goals. So uh, there, like Kelly said, there are five standards that we are uh, looking at. Uh, this is a much easier number to handle than the NEAS, where they've kind of in the last few couple of years have um, kind of pared down their standards uh, of accreditation. So they went from nine to five. So what we are uh, self-reflecting on right now are these five standards. Um, so the standard one is about learning culture, uh, basically uh, saying that, you know, the, uh, how do we as a school uh, promote the shared values and responsibility for achieving the school's vision. Uh, and also under each of these, I didn't put these up there because it'd be too many. Um, there are also substandards under each standard where we have to kind of answer uh, self-reflect on where we stand on each of these substandards but each standard has at least five or six substandards so I thought it was too much to put on there and be overwhelming so um, but we're answering you know like, like we're reflecting on each of these standards so that was standard one's learning culture standard two is student learning and basically how are we as a school um, 
do our students, you know, the student learning practicing the maxim, to practices maximize the impact of learning for each student. So how are we um, helping each student to, in the building to uh, achieve their uh, maximum uh, abilities? Okay, then standard three is professional practices. Uh, obviously that's more about what we do as a staff. Uh, professional practices ensure that practices and structures support and improve student learning. So what are we doing as a staff to provide our children uh, support and improve their learning? Uh, standard four is learning support. That's all about uh, ensuring that the school has appropriate systems uh, to support the student learning and well-being. So again, that's a lot of dealing with um, the library, the LMC, the nurses, um, guidance, um, things like that. So that's kind of where we fall with that. That's kind of standard five, uh, four. And then standard five is about learning resources and uh, that ensures that the school has the resources necessary to meet the learning needs of all students. And some of the subsections under that are like, you know, you know where do we fit uh, as far as um, budgetary issues and, and how do we, um, you, know, how, where, you know, are we providing enough uh, for our students as far as that stuff goes. So it's more about coming from the, um, this, the community and things like that. So those are the five standards. Like I said, each of the five standards have subsections underneath. Um, and like Kelly said, we're in the middle of our self-reflection now. Uh, we are at this point um, voting on, uh, we've already voted on standard four and five, those passed uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, and we are in the middle of the voting process for standard three. We're kind of working backwards, um, but yeah. And then like Kelly said, the, um, the, the report, the self reflection report is due in October. Uh, we submitted in October, so we should by the end of this year have, our goal is to by the end of this year have all of the voting done. So if we can come back in September, um, back, come back in August and September, we'll have a, a month and a half or so to kind of tidy things up and make it all look, uh, sound the same and look, and look good, so. Um, and what Bob means by voting is the process of NIAS is that once we get feedback from the staff, um, a reflection committee, which is made up of 10 other educators, um, you know, uh, each kind of assigned, two people assigned to a standard, write up that feedback um, that address all the different kind of substandards in, um, you know, the principle of effective like practice. Um, and then we put it back out to the staff to make sure that it uh, is, you know, from their perspective, accurate and, you know, um, you know kind of captures their feedback um, in a way that you know feels right, um, and then you know from there, um, after we get approval from the staff, we collect all of that to make the the final report to NIASC um, again at some point in October. All right. Any questions, Mr. Larson? Um, so from this is about every 10, 12 year process. I mean, were there any? comments or concerns from the past that had to be addressed just because usually usually when you get audited one of the first things that an auditor will do is take a look at what you were supposed to have done 10 years ago and um, I know 10 years ago there was a problem with the track and you know so obviously we, we have fixed that so I know but I mean um, I, don't, I don't know who would be um, I'm, I would think your committee you know looking at the report from the last time and just making sure that you know, there's no low-hanging fruit there for anybody to come back and... No, so, so we actually, we, we have a liaison with NIASC who works with us, mm -hmm. and um, basically she kind of talked about how since our report, the last, the last time we did this was so long ago that we're start, basically starting fresh. So, oh, okay. Yeah. One of the things, though, that I think that had been mentioned was the building in the last NIASC report. Yeah. So I, I do we think... We can check that one off. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That, that gets a check. Yeah. So learning resources, yeah. we're good. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's good to hear. So, uh, thank you. And is is there an indication of what? Uh, because I think you had mentioned that we'll have folks from other districts come in to to do like a peer review of, of sorts. Uh, do we know what districts those are? Are they typically Dart type of districts, or are they just randomly assigned whoever's? I think it's more about availability yeah. on uh, who, who gets assigned. Um, I, I'll be participating uh, in one just to kind of see what it's like. Um, and they were looking more towards uh, the roles that people fulfill within um, the, the committee. So there's a diversity in, you know, um, making sure there's, you know, classroom teachers, but then also guidance counselors and, you know, and, and trying to have that kind of diversity rather than, I think, pairing schools up with like, uh, schools with like demographics. Yes. But they will look for other comprehensive high schools. So they are trying to um, create that type of environment and balance for us. Yeah, it's kind of a combination of everything. Yes. Any other questions or comments? 
just one, and maybe it's just me looking at the timeline. It says December of 2026 is the accreditation visit. So that's assuming, you know, we've gone through the self-reflection, you've had, you know, your collaborative visits, you've, and we've implemented, you know, the things. <coughs> we've How long after that December visit do we, you know, do you know if it is, is, is at that point we've maintained our accreditation or? So there's, I, there's another process that goes. So we'll know fairly soon after that visit if we where you know where we stand with the accreditation, okay. and what uh, if they make recommendations, what we need to work on, and then there's another follow up process after that. Um, you know, this 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 doesn't this is an ongoing process for the next ten years. It's just uh, I, we just wanted to show you where we were at this point. I didn't want to get too far ahead of that because we're in the very early stages of of the uh, process. But yeah, I think uh, you know after the 2026 visit, it's a it's a pretty quick turnaround it for is. them telling you kind of where you stand, uh, where you know where their assessment of your your efforts has um, has landed. Thank you, Mr. Stores. So as far as the first class that would be graduating with the accreditation of the ESC, 2026, or would it be 2027, 28, or am I thinking wrong? But we're we're all accredited. So now. as of right we're now, maintaining it's a, our yeah. so it's just the main thing. Okay, yeah. it's just reflection and and got it. Okay, thank you. Mr. Bennett? Uh, hi. Um, I'm confused. Is there a, uh, is this a 10-year process? Or is it a process that occurs, so, so it'll be 2036 that we get our reaccreditation? Or No, no, no. It's, it's a 10-year process from the whole cycle. The whole cycle takes 10 years. But right now, we're at the very beginning of it. But in the next, by the, by their decennial visit in 2026, we'll know. Oh, it'll be 10 years since 2016 when Correct. it was done. Okay. Beautiful. My, I know my dad taught at the high school, and he tried hard to avoid getting dragged into this. So, <laughs> I, I, I'm, Honestly, I'm sorry that that happened to you. No, I mean, this, this, <laughs> and thank you for to being willing. Uh, your dad hired me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we are in the beginning, and I'll be honest, Aaron. Our first reaction was like, "Oh man, we've got so much to do mm -hmm. in the new building and so many new things." But we've really turned it into an opportunity. Um, Bob and Kelly, as well as the NIAS team, like we're, we really want to know what the staff feels that we're doing well. We want to see uh, in, you know, through the NIESC lens where we are with our accreditation. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we're really um, being able to identify for each other the great things that are happening. So I think it, we're truly using it as an opportunity and areas of where we need to grow. It's just going to help us make, just make more intentional decisions, right? I mean, there's so many things that we could be spending time and resources on, and um, but when you spread yourself too thin, you don't make the kind of gains that you, you know, can make if you really are thoughtful about um, kind of what are the priority areas and um, I'm you know that's what excites me about the process it's a lot of work it's a lot of you know digging through um, feedback and what we're doing well and what we're where we need to grow um, but I think it's really going to help us streamline some of the efforts that we're we're making at the school and, and to do good things for the the community and certainly for kids thank you I, I know that there are, are a couple of ways that one could look at a project like this. One is this is this onerous thing. We have to just like click off the boxes to get through it. Or the other is to take it, you know, with an open heart and look at it as what can we learn about ourselves. And I commend you for what looks like you're we're working really hard and I'm proud of the of being part of the school system to see that, you know, that that's the attitude we're taking. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Storrs. So the NIAS team have have they come out and visited in since the, we've had the new building? No. No. Ooh, okay. That will be next October, next October. November. All right. So it would definitely be interesting to hear their, their take on things yes. post that yeah. visit. Yeah. So. Yeah, when they visit, they'll probably meet with, ask to meet with school committee as well. Like mm -hmm. There's different steps of the, the visit that they look forward to. Right. And yeah. it's one of the very few people who was on, the, who were part of that steering committee from the last one we did a long time ago. Um, you know, a lot, like uh, Kate said, a lot of it was about the building and the resources and stuff. So there's really, you know, <laughs> since that one, we've come a long way. So. Now we can actually look at the good stuff, right? the, the teaching and the learning and the, what we do well and where we need to go. So, good to focus on that rather than the stuff we can't control. <laughs> My only other uh, comment was uh, if there is anything the committee can do to, to support the efforts or the accreditation, please let us know. Much appreciated. Because um, we know how critical this is for the district and to Mr. Bennett's point, how much work goes into this. So any way we can support. We'd love to. Very Thank much you. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What else you got for us? Um, <clears throat> I have a few uh, 
brief updates for you as well. Uh, the first, as you are well aware, um, this weekend we had uh, quite a bit of rain, somewhere between three and four inches uh, is, is, is my understanding. Uh, just wanted to let the committee know that uh, there were absolutely zero leaks at Attleboro High School through that uh, experience. So we are making progress on that front and uh, it was a watershed moment uh, that we got through an event like that um, without incident. And any large puddles? Uh, I'm sure there were large puddles all over the place. But uh, you, know, you know what I'm asking. I mean, is there any areas outside of the building that had water issues? Right? I'm not aware of any flooding. That Thank we, you. Uh, I know other buildings, as the Sun Chronicle correctly reported, there are concerns with leaks. Did, were those, was there anything uh, surprising or substantially damaging <laughs> the other buildings? Uh, so we had uh, considerable leaks in uh, Thatcher, as we expected and have been experiencing, and as the, the paper chronicled. So that was not surprising, but um, you know, further evidence of that. Uh, to our surprise, we didn't get water in Coelho, um, uh, which no one can explain. That's some file that one under miracle. Um, <laughs> and then we also had um, minor leaks at Hyman Fine and Hill Roberts that we did not expect. And upon investigation, we have found a problem with two uh, roof drain in both buildings. Um, that we believe are original to the buildings, which would explain why they've rotted out. Um, so that did lead to uh, minor leaks in those buildings, but we're going to address those. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> as you might be aware, uh, on Monday, April 8th, uh, there will be a eclipse. Um, we've heard a uh, tale of uh, some districts uh, being very concerned about this to the degree that some people are dismissing early that day. Um, uh, we talked through and saw no reason um, to, to take that drastic of a step, but we do understand that because of the timing of the eclipse, which is between 2.15 and 4.30, it happens basically at dismissal. And even though the, the, you know, the path of the eclipse is not directly over us, um, it is close enough that it's, it's supposed to be a pretty uh, intense thing. And there is a, a, a real danger here that uh, if people look at directly at the eclipse during that time period, uh, you, you damage your retina pretty quickly. So um, as a precautionary uh, uh, maneuver, uh, wanting to keep our kids safe, knowing that we'll be sending them home during the, the period that is the concern, um, we are buying Eclipse glasses for every student in the district uh, to make sure that uh, they have the equipment they need to be safe. Uh, we will be spending time in school uh, making sure the kids understand the danger. Um, certainly a lot of our classes where it's appropriate, there'll be talks about the, 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 the science behind it, um, but we'll also be communicating to parents about all of this and asking for their support and helping us to educate our kids to make sure that they're safe uh, after they, they leave us uh, on that day. So um, I knew, you know that there were some people that were wondering what we were doing and just wanted to update the committee on what the district's plans were. Okay. Um, Another thing that uh, parents can expect to hear from us soon, uh, you may be aware that uh, there are no longer any specific guidelines about COVID. Um, it's not that they've changed, it's that they literally don't exist. There are no COVID specific guidelines anymore. Um, basically, we are being told by the, the experts to treat COVID like the flu. Um, so uh, we are going to um, follow what is now referred to as the respiratory virus prevention guidance recommendations um, this isn't a rule, this is, these are recommendations, and you can summarize them pretty quickly by just saying, if your symptoms are improving and you've been without a fever for 24 hours, you are cleared to return. And that goes for employees, so we're t we've already notified staff that that's the, the way we're conducting ourselves now, but we'll be soon sending home something from our nurses, informing parents that that's how uh, they should treat their children as well. So that's a pretty significant change because we have been operating under the old uh, guidelines that it's still been in place about you know the five days and and, and that approach uh, but that has ended and we are making that shift so I wanted uh, to notify the committee of that change all right last thing um, my FY25 update for you this evening uh, the public notice of the proposed FY25 budget is in today's paper um, I don't know if you noticed but there there it is in the classified section um, that is in line with uh, our, budget, our budget presentation on Monday the 8th, uh, which will start with the public hearing. All right, so that was in today's paper so that we could meet the, the timeline required to have the hearing at our meeting on the 8th, in which uh, Mr. Furtado will be pr uh, presenting the budget to you all for consideration. Um, 
you'll remember that we are looking for you to pass uh, you know, your request by the next meeting after that, which is the I believe, 22nd. Um, two you know, key notes, uh, the, the mayor's uh, commitment above net school spending has been maintained in this budget. Um, and that, as a result of that, uh, you know, we really appreciate the, all this hard work on the city side uh, to provide us with what is now a level service budget. Um, exactly how we're uh, pulling off all that magic, Mark, we'll get into the details uh, next time. But, uh, you know, just to be clear, the number that's in the paper and now is a very public thing, uh, does rep that number does represent level services um, and does maintain uh, the commitment from the mayor that we had last year as well. So that's all good news and uh, certainly um, will make FY25 something manageable for the school district. So I know that uh, the a lot of the state numbers will be fine, and we'll talk a little bit about the state in a bit, but uh, I know a lot of that information is being confirmed shortly <laughs> after our April 8th meeting. Is Yeah, so we, we anticipate a, a vote from the House on April 10th, I think. Um, so uh, we'll have better numbers for consideration on the 22nd. And yeah, the, the, you know, as it is every year, it, it's a moving target, mm -hmm. um, but we know of no reason to think that the numbers are going to get Decrease. worse, which is possible, but um, again, there's been no signal to that specifically. So hopefully whatever changes, it'll be heading in the positive direction, which is only for the better anyways. Any other questions? Oh, Mr. Bennett. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. The, um, in, the, in that city's contribution, I haven't seen the breakdown yet, is the, the surplus ESSER funds uh, they are coming back to us. The short answer to that is yes. All right. Are they coming back in addition to the net school spend, or are they part of the yeah, net, so net school spend? Yeah, so I don't think there's an easy answer to that because there's some complicated maneuvers going on uh, with different money and different sources, which is why um, I think Mr. Furtado's uh, presentation in two weeks will be helpful in clarifying exactly how we're getting there. But you know, there is the commitment above net school spending and there is the return of the unexpended funds. Those things are definitely true. Um, but there are other things, you know, there are things that work against us in terms of, we don't even know what uh, kind of credits the cities can take, so that the city can take, so there's gonna, that's, a, that's a, a variable that we don't know. Uh, there's some debt money that's working against the budget. So it's actually not an easy thing to just sort of uh, summarize in, in, in a simple way. So. Uh, Mark will will break it down so that you can get <coughs> we get there um, because it is a little bit com more complicated than it normally is. Okay, thank you, Mr. Storz. I'm sure this is complicated too. Then, um, what is the amount above net school spending, please? Not including us. One point six million. Okay, right, thanks. Any other questions? He didn't make any noises behind me, did he? No, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got it right. I mean, you've it's really not hyped up the bu budget presentation for April 8th, so we're, we've yeah. got some, some high hopes. Hopefully you get that done. <laughs> this is just a sneak preview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. I'm the hype man. <laughs> <laughs> you did a great job. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? That concludes my report. <coughs> uh, thank you, Superintendent Sawyer. Um, uh, something you didn't mention, but um, Mr. Larson and I briefly discussed before the meeting. Uh, congratulations on an incredible Night to Discover event. Um, uh, that was two weeks ago now, which is crazy. Uh, but that was, that was an incredible event, and congratulations to the educators and the students that participated at all the levels. Um, <laughs> it was, that was really a, a fun night to, uh, to walk around this building. So. Uh, Next item on the agenda is a res uh, resolution related to Chapter 70 funding calculations. Um, the, uh, the resolution uh, was distributed via email this morning. Um, uh, before I entertain the motion, um, a little bit of uh, context for the community. Uh, shortly after our last meeting, the Haverhill School Committee uh, passed a resolution to uh, remove the 4.5% uh, inflation index cap that is part of the Chapter 70 funding formula. Uh, the reason for this being um, that since the implementation of the Student Opportunity Act, uh, the limiting, <laughs> it, 
it, it happened to coincide with a drastic increase in inflation over the last couple of years, uh, upwards of 7 to 8% inflation. And so uh, foundation budget calculations were not able to keep up with rising costs. Uh, so Haverhill's intent was to uh, remove, that, uh, remove that cap in an effort to uh, award districts money that they should have been getting all along over the last couple of years. Uh, <laughs> since then, um, and I know some of us uh, received an email from the Haverhill School Committee estimating that our, uh, that the Attleboro Public Schools would benefit somewhere around $6 million uh, for FY25. Um, we're not sure how they arrived at that number. We think it's in relation to retroactive inflation possibly, but that's not something that we were able to confirm. Uh, since then, uh, the Massachusetts Association of School Committees sent out a communication that kept the 4.5% cap in place but provided wording uh, that could go into the Chapter 70 law that still made up for lost inflation in the coming years. And uh, thank you to the tremendous efforts of the administration uh, in, in working with me to calculate what that might look like, and, and we're estimating that that would be uh, approximately a $1.6 million benefit for FY25. Um, and it sounds, again, like they would calculate that out going forward, so what future years would look like is to be determined. Uh, so that is the, the background <coughs> of this resolution. Um, so with that, uh, I will entertain a motion uh, to adopt the resolution as provided. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Uh, any comments or discussion? Mr. Domenici? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so having read this, I, you know, anything that's going to help the Attleboro Public Schools, I'm, I'm certainly going to be for. Um, one thing I would note out is our, our state representative, Jim Hawkins, he's been very good about going after every dollar he can for Attleboro in the public school systems. Um, he, he fought to get increases in our budget previously when enrollment numbers were off. He tried to get additional funding for us when, you know, for special ed out of district costs. And he's already gone in front of the Ways and Means Committee about this very issue even before we even knew Haverhill was sending us anything. Um, and I think he, um, in speaking with him, he did give a lot of credit to Mr. Sawyer and Mr. Furtado for providing him with information that would be suitable. I know that should we pass this resolution, he will immediately take this directly to Ways and Means where he says it will have an impact on their decision. So um, I, I do hope we adopt this tonight. Mr. Storrs? Yeah, I mean, the fact that there was a limit based on inflation in me is dumbfounding. Uh, and, and to have one of, uh, you know, mask or masks actually try to maintain that limit uh, is surprising to me. You, you would think anybody who's involved in schools would see that, you know, that you shouldn't have a limiting factor on something that, you know, can go beyond, um, like inflation. Um, and the last few years, the last three years and two months has been getting worse and worse when it comes to this inflation stuff. So um, I, I, I can't help but think that this is a no-brainer. You know, it's, um, I don't think it's going to make a difference up at the State House. You know, I hope Jim can uh, make some miracles happen for us and, and for the rest of the uh, state. But um, to me, this seems like a no-brainer. And, and I will say the, the reason both the, uh, the mass communication or the mass proposal and the Haverhill proposal are both mentioned in the resolution uh, is really a demonstration that um, from, from uh, my standpoint, and it, I think others around the table might agree, uh, <laughs> it's almost like we don't care what you do, <laughs> but something has to be done. Um, and, and I know that that has been the uh, Representative Hawkins uh, message for, for a long time for Attleboro as well. Uh, Mr. Bennett. Thank you. Uh, I would just uh, comment in addition. I know that Jim Hawkins is supportive of this, and uh, and we, Rob and I, we both heard from uh, Adam Scanlon, who's the representative for just for Ward 3B. We're sort of carved out of the corner, and and he's also generally supportive of this, and, and is going to work hard to try to bring this to fruition. So, I'm, I'm opti I, I'm probably naively optimistic, but I am nonetheless optimistic that something good will come from this. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Yeah, the four the four point five percent is is always been a struggle because there's significant pieces of our budget that we have very little control over being 
uh, the cost of medical insurance and the cost of um, just special ed in general, you know, transportation of special ed and out of district special ed nursing. And to try to think that those were going to live in a proposition two and a half over, you know, proposition two and a half world or even a four and a half percent uh, cap situation within the, the funding formula has been one of the reasons Attleboro's just continued to slide backwards, you know, from a funding point of view, even though all the great efforts of everyone at, you know, City Hall and everywhere else, it just, the formula has been working against us right, right from the go for years. Um, so, I mean, this is, if nothing else, it's great to bring just a, some sunlight to that 4.5 number uh, for some of these situations that, you know, we really don't have control over, but, you know, are mandated to, uh, to live with. So. Any other comments or thoughts? I will say uh, two quick uh, additional thoughts from me. Um, Haverhill is a school district. It's one of our DART districts, so comparable to Attleboro. Uh, that is a district that pays about $2,700 more per student and uh, is at 8% above net school spending. And if they are pointing out that they are hurting as a result of this, I think a district that's in our fiscal situation, uh, this is a, a huge red flag. So, uh, so I'm, I'm grateful for the support that I'm hearing on this. Um, and uh, back in January when we voted uh, on a resolution to support the Cherish Act, um, Mr. Larson made a comment about, uh, about struggling to support money going elsewhere. And, and part, of, uh, part of the, I forget the formal name for it, but I'll refer to it as the millionaire's tax. Part of that campaign was that that money was going to go to education. And uh, now we're at the point where it's all going to higher education. And where we thought we were going to be getting some of that. Um, I happen to agree with Mr. Larson's sentiment at that time that it's tough to support money going elsewhere where, when we are in such a, a, a desperate need for funds. So, uh, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, any other thoughts or comments? All right, uh, I'm, going to, I'm actually going to do a, a roll call vote for this as uh, part of the process for sharing this with the state. Uh, so a roll call vote, I'll start with Mr. Bennett. Yes. Ms. Porto. Yes. Mr. Storrs. Yes. Mr. Larson. Yes. Mr. Geddes, yes. Mr. Domenici. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Frappier. Yes. Excellent. Thank you all very much. Mr. Hawkins, if you're watching, you'll hear from me first thing tomorrow morning. All right, uh, next item on the agenda is approving our minutes from our Monday, March 11th meeting. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. All right, any comments, thoughts? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Uh, consent agenda, we have six items for tonight. Uh, so I will entertain a motion to accept a donation in the amount of $5,000 from Lisa Frolio in memory of her father to use towards senior obligations. Motion to accept a donation in the amount of $582 from VHS Incorporated to support AP fees for the economically disadvantaged students. Motion to accept an anonymous donation of 40, 25 economically disadvantaged students and families. Motion to accept an anonymous donation in the amount of $3,900 to the Attleboro Public Schools to be used at the superintendent's discretion. Motion to accept in the uh, payment in the amount of $32.70 from Bay State Textiles to Hill Roberts. Motion to accept the contractual obligation in the amount of $64 from Planet Aid Incorporated as broken down in the check receipt dated March 14th, 2024 and motion to approve a day field trip for 140 grade eight Coelho students to go to Canopy Lake Park in Salem, New Hampshire on June 6th, 2024. So moved. Second. Any comments? It's that we get a lot of anonymous donations and while they don't wanna be recognized, we, I think we can say wholeheartedly, we always appreciate it. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, we often get PTO and business donations, but these are, for the most part, sizable, individual, uh, anonymous or not, donations. Um, and it's, it's, it's incredible to, to see, so. 
All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Uh, subcommittee meetings, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Johnson for uh, teaching and learning. <coughs> that is. Uh, the teaching and learning subcommittee last met on Tuesday, March uh, 12th. And at that meeting, we had two guest speakers with us. We had uh, Ms. Uh, Yvonne Medeiros, the Director of Special Education, to give us some updates, as well as uh, Jeremy Gray, the Director of our CTE program. Um, Ms. Medeiros provided some updates regarding the new IEP form. Um, the DESI had updated the form. It was last updated many years ago, I think it was 2004. Um, and it's important for families to know that the layout of the form is different, but the contents of the form are going to remain the same. Um, the main reason for the, the update to the, of the form is because the state wanted to rebalance the main categories uh, that are addressed on the form and also emphasize the students' involvement with establishing their, their IEP, both their short and, and long-term goals that are outlined in that IEP. Um, so she, she did let us know that the, the staff, including educators, the paras, uh, contractors, psychologists, counselors, have all been educated about the new form. And we are going to be rolling this out in the 24-25 school year. So for families that have existing IEPs, there's no immediate change. Um, they will transition to the new form at their three-year evaluation of the student's IEP. Um, all <coughs> students that are newly registered for an individual uh, will be using the updated form on, on the go forward. Um, and just like the existing form, the new form will be able to be accessed by their families in Aspen. Um, we also had a really deep and robust update regarding our CTE programs. A lot of really exciting things I want to share with you. Um, to start off, the freshman exploratory, which is always the first and second trimester, has come to a conclusion. Um, and again, the students have reported back that not only do they get a taste of all the available programs to kind of find really where their interest might lie, <coughs> they're also appreciative of the real world experience, uh, really practical things that they, they have learned in culinary and automotive, et cetera. Um, so just, again, just want to emphasize what a, what a value um, and how exciting that is that we can offer that to our students. Of the class of 2027, the current freshman class, uh, 466 students chose to enroll in a CTE program, and that represents 95% of the class of 2027. So um, real, real excited to hear those. Uh, those stats. So, and I'm also pleased to report that the overwhelming majority of students enrolling into their CTE course got their first choice. Um, and then I wanted to call out a few things about some specific programs and some specific things happening within uh, the CTE department. Um, we currently have 19 programs. 18 of them have been Chapter 74 certified. We have one more that is about to become certified, and that's the Environmental Science Program. Um, some people may already be aware, remember we've talked about freight farms in the past. Um, if they've been following social media for the high school, they may have seen a couple pictures. Um, so what is a freight farm and how does this work with the Environmental Science Program? So what the freight farm is, it's an enclosed and nearly self-sustaining grow house. Um, it's partially automated. Um, there's going to be some features that the, the teacher can actually monitor from an app if it gets too hot, too cold, so we always know what's going on uh, within the grow house. This grow house can produce the same volume as a one-acre parcel of land, and the students that will be in the environmental science program are going to be learning the current growing technology and, and methods. Um, and then what they produce from this freight farm uh, they're going to be using this produce with the culinary department and the Blue Pride Bistro. Um, there are plans <coughs> to partner with our local food banks and to have a presence at the Attleboro Farmers Market going forward. 
And another exciting thing that I'd like to report out is the money that was used to acquire the freight farm was 100% funded by grants. So thank you, um, the CT uh, program for that. I also want to call out our medical assistant program. Again, speaking of grants, we were recently able to acquire augmented reality programs and special laptops that our medical and dental students will be using, along with a, I pronounce this incorrectly, a, an anamitage tosh table. Uh, it's basically a, a table where the, uh, the medical students can uh, can see different different layers of the body. Lots of really exciting stuff going on there. Um, and at the time of our meeting, um, the medical students were completing their clinical trials at Sturdy Memorial Hospital. And um, the the students that are in the students that participate in the clinical medical clinical trials are not only from Attleboro High School, but they're from other districts of, as well. Um, and their feedback from the 